very rare breed, and we're just very happy to have him here. He will tell us about uh, controlling the sea's evolution. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation. I'm just going to make sure I have all of the electronics strapped directly to my body before I start. So just bear with me. Um, great. Yeah, so I can wander away and everyone can still hear? Yeah? OK, cool. So I'm going to, I liked very much what Peter did, just discussing how he got where he is. Because I think especially for a training group to hear disparate paths is important. And so I'll start with just like a couple of minutes about, about me and how I got to become a mathematical oncologist and radiation oncologist, whatever that is. Well, radiation oncologist, you probably know what it is. But a mathematical oncologist or a theoretical oncologist, well, what is that? And, and how many of us are there? As I'll, I'll let you know it's countable. Um, but, but we're a growing breed, I like to think. Um, so I originally was a physicist as an undergraduate. Uh, so and I, was a, I graduated undergrad in 98, so I'm 40, 43 years old now. After I finished my physics degree, I went into the Navy in the US and did nuclear engineering. So for, for quite a while, I was sort of boiling water under, somewhere underwater, far away. Um, in order to keep world peace for some reason. But it ended up feeling like uh, our personal, uh, you know, the, the free world's um, nuclear doctrine is basically called mutually assured destruction. The idea being that if you nuke us, we'll nuke you, and then we'll all die, so no one should do that. And that really didn't seem like the best way to support humanity to me. Um, and so after I finished my tours of duty, I decided to, tr to try medicine instead, which seemed like a bit more of a kind discipline. Um, but in the course of going through medicine, I realized that it was very frustratingly empiric. And, and if you ask, as a physicist, you know, you're always like, why? 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 Can you show me the first principles? How does that work? And it turns out in medical school, nobody wants to ask those questions or answer those questions. And because there's a lot of black boxes, really, about physiology. We understand some things, but a lot of passive physiology is, is difficult to understand, especially for non-scientist physicians who are really practicing an art. Um, and so I was really quite frustrated by that. Um, I ended up finding my way into radiation oncology, mostly because I thought I understood the particle physics pretty well. Why not do radiation oncology? And then it sort of made this kind of like kismet like connection. I was like, I used to use radiation to kill everyone, and now I'm going to use radiation to heal people. So it sort of felt like a big hug. And you know, the physicists inside me felt happy. Um, but then the empiric nature of practice was frustrating. So I was, I was at one of the top uh, centers in the US, top centers in the world, if you will. And still, my patients would come in, and, and I'm really good. I'm smart, right? I'm well-trained. I have the best toys, the best tools. And still, their results are 50-50, right? And I don't know why. I'm practicing the best standard evidence-based medicine there is. And I can't tell the woman in room one if she'll be the one who dies, or the man in room two if it'll be him. And that, to me, was unacceptable. And so that drove me back to science. And I ended up finding a post in um, the other university in England, in Oxford, uh, to study mathematical biology. And that was when I was 37, starting a PhD in maths. That was a bit um, daunting. But I think the lesson is that I've always just been following what made sense to me and what questions were important to me and what skills I needed. And I think it's never too late to change direction. It's never too late if you're passionate about something to do something new. And so if you find ever in your career that you're hitting a wall and you're no longer pleased with what you're doing, just change. Uh, you only get one life, and it's worth giving it a shot. So anyways, finished PhD, or DPhil, I should say, there a few years ago, five or six years ago, and then took a group leader position where I am now in Cleveland Clinic. So I have a group of about 10 or so physicists slash computer scientists slash mathematicians, basically all comers, um, inc including cell biologists and, and others. And I think I really like the, the message we had earlier from Dr. Brenton that, that it takes a team. It takes many disciplines to get these complex problems solved. And so I'll show you today uh, a, a suite of three different mathematical models. And the exciting result at the end that I'm going to build up to is I think I've figured out a way, I think, I think my team has figured out a way to speed up the evolution of drug resistance. And everyone should be like, why do you want to do that? That's a terrible idea. Um, be, and I'll, I'll tell you why. <laughs> the point is, but I'm not going to tell you right now. I'm going to lead up to it. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be a climactic, climactic finish where you see why speeding up drug resistance is a good idea or, or could be in certain situations a good idea. So I will show some maths. I will show some simulations. Um, I will show some informatics. I will show some sequencing. So we're going to be all over the shop. That's OK. Um, and I'm a physicist. So physicists are usually are quite 
comfortable being rudely interrupted in the middle of things. So just like shout out questions. It would be much more uh, interesting if we chat about your questions whilst we're talking about the nidus for them rather than at the end when everyone's already forgotten. So just put your hand up, shout it out, whatever, and we'll go. So yeah, we're going to talk about how to control disease evolution. Because as a physician, I don't want to just predict it. I want to control it. Right? I want to get my hands on the knobs of the things that's killing my patients. I don't just want to be like figuring out it's the woman in room one and not the man in room two. That would be a good step, because we can't even do that now. But really, I want to turn the knobs. And I want to use, I think we can use first principles and rigorous descriptions to do that. So off we go. Any questions about my career? Yes, I have a lot of med school debt. Um, also, so I'm going to go through a whole bunch of papers, four or five or six papers that I'm going to talk about as vignettes. If you don't want to write them down, you can scan that with your phone just now, and it'll bring up a list of the references. I'll also put that up again at the end in case you miss it, but I'll sit here for another five seconds while people do it. It's just as a list of the references so you don't have to write stuff down, and you can listen instead. Cool. Okay. Again, I'll put it up at the end if folks want. So, before I go into the doom of gloom of drug resistance, let's remember that cancer is actually number one cause of death in the, in the first world now, as of like three weeks ago I saw this on Twitter. Number one cause of death, it just surpassed heart disease. So this is a big problem. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about uh, some, of the, some bugs and some pathogens. So I'll show you some data from E. coli today as well, because what I think is really driving all of these problems is the evolutionary process itself. It's not that it's a cancer, or that it's an E. coli, or that it's a MRSA, or that it's a malaria, or that it's a pest in the field. It's that evolution works and solves problems really, really well. And as humans, we like to impose problems to these evolving species, but it wins. So uh, but cancer's bad, bugs are also bad, um, but at the end of the day, uh oh. At the end of the day, we do a pretty good job of making software to give presentations. Uh-oh. So the point is, that the next slide while we figure this out, is that most infections are cured by antibiotics. You get an ear infection, you get a titus media, you go to your physician, they give you some augmentin, you get better. Most early stage cancers are cured. Chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, we cure most people with early stage cancers, right? So before we go into the doom of gloom of that, remember that the medicines we do have work really well for the most part. The problem comes in the isolated cases when they don't, when evolution has figured out solutions to these otherwise excellent medicines. And that's what we're going to focus on. I'm not going to focus on the good aspects because we've already got that sorted. So let's focus down on the others. What are the questions that people have right now? Come on, you guys get already confused, right? So with your mathematical training, you must be really good giving chalk talks. <laughs> I, li I like giving, ch I like giving chalk talks. We, we could do, actually. Um, well, which paper of mine did the journal club read? Does anyone, did anyone read any, any of my papers? There we go. I hope it wasn't the game theory one, because I decided not to talk about that today. OK, good. Here we go. So super bugs, cancer, radiation. Okay, cool. So uh, what does a radiation oncologist do? So this is one of my jobs. I'm a brachytherapist. So we can take a chest wall tumor. And this is a woman, a 53-year-old woman I treated a few years ago, four years ago, as a matter of fact. We removed a tumor from her chest wall. You can actually see what the tumor looked like. On the right, there's a little video. Not, or not. Wow, it's going to be awesome today. So we're going to work with this. It's going to be great. And if not, we're not going to worry about it. On the right, we see this woman's chest wall and this bl blue volume there was the tumor and what I covered with the, my catheters, she's cured five years later, even with a stage three tumor. So these things work. Um, but when disease becomes metastatic, we can still help, right? So this is actually an 18-year-old boy I'm treating currently. This is a Ewing sarcoma, fourth relapse. Uh, the chemo worked. He was a competitive swimmer. He had a pelvic Ewings. We gave him radiation and chemo, went away. Four years later, came back. Treated him with a new line of chemo. It worked. Disease went away until it didn't, and then it came back. This is his fourth, this looks maybe like where his heart should be. It's this massive tumor sitting right on top of this 18-year-old boy's heart. That being said, I can probably cure this tumor with highly focused radiation therapy. The problem is we know it's elsewhere, and we know it's going to come back again. And this is the disease that kills our patients. Um, and what about targeted therapies? We have this wonderful new world of targeted therapy where we have effectively, as Dr. Brenton said, cured some tumors like chronic myelogenous leukemia. 
Um, this is a, a this is a BRAF driven melanoma. We have this amazing this gentleman's quote unquote lucky. He has the special mutation which is druggable, the drug called demurafenib. You take some pills, you feel fine, your tumor goes away, and you have just enough time to sort the rest of your life out before it comes back. And this happens in solid tumors at least every single time, with the exception of really rare caveats where. Uh, we get lucky, or maybe we've gotten such a low disease burden that it doesn't break. But this evolutionary process which is driving this is the same process which is driving this in other tumors, other bugs. This is happening across the kingdoms of life. So this is, this is a fundamental process which underpins all of these processes. And these things happen on clinical timescales. This is four months, five months. This isn't some you know, dinosaur evolution problem that we, we can stop caring about. This happens in bugs as well. Does anyone know this beautiful paper? The megaplate experiment. If you don't, you should uh, download the paper and read it. It's just gorgeous. In, I'll describe the experiment. This is a simulation we've just done of the same experiment. Basically, you see the E. coli. This, this plate here is actually 12 feet by 6 feet. That's a lot of E. coli. You see this edge of it with wild type E. coli and put no drug in the agar. And you put three times the MIC. That's the minimum inhibitory concentration, which is like a certain concentration of a drug that will stop the bug from growing. You put three times here, 30 times here, 300 times here, 3,000 times the concentration of drug that would normally kill this bug. And within 12 days, the bugs have figured out multiple solutions, right? Each of these little points is a different solution to that drug. So let's say you have a targeted therapy that's really good for this one. Do you think that's going to help all your patients? Do you think that having a drug that affects this when you can solve these problems so quickly is going to save the day? I'm going to argue that it's not. I'm going to argue that the promise of targeted therapy, the promise of cancer treatment and therapy today, which is find a new mutation, make a new drug, which by the way takes 10 years and $15 billion, give it to your patients. I'm going to argue that that might not be the most sensible way forward. I'm going to argue that instead we should back away and study the evolutionary process itself. So how are we going to do that? So in my lab, uh, I use a bunch of different kinds of tools. We use some systems biology. We use stochastic models, um, stochastic models that you can write down answers for. We use ODEs, game theory. We use bugs. I stick things into people. We grow cells if we have to and count them. And today we'll talk a lot about a lot of these different things. But I think the idea here is that it's not one, it's, you can't be a one trick pony and solve problems of this complexity. And I think this is a really cool group of people because you're coming together with diverse backgrounds, diverse sets of speakers, and you're seeing there's diverse approaches of the way we're going to work and, and doing them together. And so this is my sort of cancer worldview, but it could be uh, I've given the same talk with antibiotic folks, and you could say this is my evolutionary disease worldview. So this is a Mueller plot. We saw similar plots like in Dr. Brenton's talk. The idea here being you have a single agent at the beginning. Maybe it's a E. coli, maybe it's a malaria, maybe it's a cancer cell. And as the population, which is the height of this Y dimension, as the population expands, we start to have events, right? We start to mutate. Maybe a new clone arises here at this branch point, if you will. Maybe a new clone arises here. Maybe they interact. Maybe there's something that happens between the clones that actually increases their fitness. In a non so in pop gen, we call this clonal interference. In mathematical oncology, we think about things called evolutionary games. Most of the time, and then so once, once we've expanded this beautiful heterogeneity, which is what most of the time we study, we biopsy a patient, we find their tumor, we find this heterogeneity, we try to dissect it in such a way that we can understand what's going on, who's there, but it's already there. And if you're lucky enough to have one, let's, let's say all the mutations above my pointer all map to sensitivity to drug B, but 1% doesn't. That's lucky, right? But, but you're still hosed because 10% are, are resistant. And so if you're lucky enough to find that, you're still in bad shape. So I'm going to argue that we should zoom back and start studying these processes here. Oh, got an email. Study these processes here and maybe figure out ways to modulate this heterogeneity or perturb this heterogeneity before it gets so vast, such that we can better understand these final convergent states of sensitivity and resistance. So that's what we're going to go for. And then also we're going to try to do it fast today, because the final result is um, about speed. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Questions? Nope. OK, what cool. What do you think that uh, phenotypic convergence is only at the end of a process? It is not happening together, for example, with genetic heterogeneity? It is absolutely happening at every step. OK. Yeah, so, so, so you, you could choose any time point along this continuum, and this convergence would happen. So I could choose here, and there'd be convergence. I could choose here, and there'd be convergence. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good, good question. I just happened to represent it at the end for convenience. 
Okay. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a mathematical object which we all need to have in our heads for the rest of the talk to make sense. And it's called a fitness landscape. It's a very, very, very simple representation of how to get from genotype to phenotype. So it's a genotype phenotype map. We're all comfortable thinking about things that are in two dimensions to mapping to a third, like hills and valleys. Clearly, this is not how our genome is, the architecture of our genome works, but as humans stuck in a three dimensional world, we can't visualize anything more than this. So we're going to think about this concept, but then we're going to let the power of algebra allow us to extend into multiple dimensions. But you don't have to worry about that because we're going to keep all our pictures in three dimensions. Otherwise, we'd need like 3D glasses and LSD or something. And I don't think the University of Cambridge would supply either of those. Um, I'm not sure. Would it? <laughs> um, so let's, let's frame our thinking around this, and I'll, and I'll show you why I care. And then I also want to bring up another concept, which is going to be a theme that comes out through the rest of the talk. This is the idea of collateral sensitivity. So uh, let me give you a follow the following Gedanken experiment. So we can take uh, some wild type of some cell line. This happens to be an alkyl arranged non-small cell lung cancer for the biologists in the group. And let's expose that to drug for a long time, however many months, six months. This is a paper we wrote a few years ago. Um, so now you have at the end a resistant population, yeah? So you have two populations, the resistant one and the wild type one. They started both from this one. Then you can ask the following question. You can say, how does the sensitivity of the resistant type c compare to the sensitivity of the wild type in some other drug? not the one we've been selecting with. So for example, if I become seritinib resistant from the wild type, how does the wild type and seritinib, how does the wild type and resistant sensitivity compare in paclitaxel? So in this case, paclitaxel will be more resistant. So this is a color, color bar that's divergent. So white will be zero. So slightly red means it is collaterally resistant. So this is resistant to seritinib because that's what you evolved in but it also became more resistant to paclitaxel just by chance. There's also examples where it becomes incredibly sensitive to drugs like pemetrexid. So you can then read off, this is actually, every one of these is a very large experiment, which is frustrating, but you can then think about this being a readout of how the evolutionary change in a given selective pressure affects the sensitivity to other selective pressures. Is that clear in everyone's head? Please. Oh, go ahead. We'll, we'll have time for both. Yeah. I'm going to answer that question soon. We'll come back to that one. No. <laughs> no, they won't be the same. Sir. Going back to the bacteria world, are you sure that it's really resistance and not, for example, tolerance of the system? Um, so we've done, so I'll show a paper later in a few slides where we do this in E. coli on many, many, many replicates. And we've done the whole genome sequencing and there, do, there are resistance mutations that have been well documented. So I would, I would put the two questions together and say, sometimes when you do it, it might be tolerance. And sometimes you do it, it might be resistance. Because if we go back to our hills and valleys, there's many solutions to this problem. So it's not that each time you do the experiment, you very well might find a different solution. And that's a little bit killing the thunder of the next few slides, but that's OK. So yeah. Yes, I'm not sure. No, it won't be the same every time. Other questions? No. OK. So everyone's comfortable with the concept of collateral sensitivity. Yeah, OK. Um, and part of the reason I, I'm not focusing on this paper is because halfway through these six month long experiments, I came to the realization from a theoretical point of view, which I'll show you the results for in a minute, that it probably wouldn't be the same if I did it again. And therefore, I don't actually trust. I trust that what I'm reporting here is what happened, but I don't trust that this is a, a, a sensible way to predict the future. And we'll get there. OK, so now let's think about how those two concepts come together graphically to frame our thinking. So now we're going to bring together this concept of collateral sensitivity with the fitness landscapes. And then everyone's going to have a beautiful moment of understanding. And you're all going to quit what you're doing and come do maths with me. So let's imagine we have some genotype here, a wild type creature. And let's say that this landscape is now the selective pressure that is my first line therapy, whatever therapy that is. I don't care. So what you can see is that there's two ways for this individual to beat this drug, right? It can go up at selection. What, what, is, what does evolution do? It goes up hill in fitness space, right? So we're going to climb this hill. And then once we get to this point here, once we're at the blue triangle, to get fitter, we have to choose. Now, we're not going to choose. We're going to, uh, evolution's going to be random, but we're going to select the fitter type. So you're going to end up basically here or here, or maybe some combination, to be fair. So let's say this is our first drug. 
Now let's say this is our second drug. Would this be a good or a bad second drug to give? Shout it out. Bad, right? Because the solutions it's found in the first drug confer high fitness in the second drug. So this is going to be a completely useless second line therapy. How about this one? Flip a coin, good or bad, right? So you, I could do the experiment and say, this is a perfect one because it was Monday. And then on Tuesday, I could say, oh, it's the worst drug I've ever seen. I can't tell the difference between this one and this one if it happened to choose this wild type, or sorry, this choice. And then this is sort of the pie in the sky, perfect second line drug, where no matter what evolutionary solution the disease chooses in the first instance, in the second instance, it's there. So this is, this is sort of the, what we're looking for in these cases. Does everyone understand the sort of concepts that we've had so far? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so the key questions I'm gonna try to answer during the course of this talk are, where will evolution drive a disease? under a given selective pressure? What are the evolutionary consequences to that driving? So are there collateral sensitivities or collateral resistances that come from that location? So if I drive a disease reliably here, is that good or bad? And under other therapies. How fast will it go? Is it gonna go there tomorrow? Is it gonna go there a month from now? Or in the first paper I'm gonna show you results from, is it gonna go there an infinite time? Mathematicians love taking limits, right? And actually convergence is much easier if you just allow T to go to infinity. But my 18 year old swimmer who has a Ewing sarcoma enveloping his bronchus doesn't wanna wait infinite time. Nor does he have infinite time to wait. So how fast will it go? And more importantly, can I control any of these things? Can I get my hands on the knobs under the hood and affect this change? because they don't want to wait, and I don't want to watch them die anymore. So uh, to answer the question, where will evolution drive a disease, we started a few years ago. This is a clever PhD student from Oxford named Dan Nickel, who now does football analytics, which means I've failed as a mentor. Um, I had lunch with him the other day. He's really happy, so right on. And he's still doing stats. He said his job basically now is just describing the central limit theorem to football coaches, which sounds like a pretty good job, I guess. Uh, anyways, he's happy. So this is a paper we wrote in Plus Computational Biology. This is in the reference list. Don't have to write it down. Uh, the most important thing about this paper, does anyone know who that is? The most important thing about this paper has to do with this man, Paul Erdos. Does anyone know what an Erdos number is? Uh, so my Erdos number is three, which is like really good. So an Erdos number is like a Bacon number. Does anyone know like a Kevin Bacon number? That's how closely related you are to Kevin Bacon when it comes to movies. So if you've been in a movie with someone who's been in a movie with Kevin Bacon, your Bacon number is two. If you've been in a movie with Kevin Bacon, one. So this guy's dead, so it's impossible to get any more ones. And all the ones are now starting to die. So even twos are hard to get. But I found a two, this guy. He was my neighbor's dad. I explained our paper to him. I asked for some constructive feedback. He's a computer scientist, it worked out. He even suggested a more efficient algorithm. We implemented it. But he's a co-author and now I'm an Erdosh 3. There are people who have license plates that say Erdosh 3. It's important, it's a big deal. There's mathematicians in the room, people will be like lining up right now to work with me to get a four. Wikipedia pages list this. Anyway, um, in this paper, we really thought hard about how to mathematically translate this concept of hill climbing and evolutionary consequences into a, a mathematical formalism that we could study more, more efficiently. So what we did, was we asked this question, can we irreversibly steer evolution to specific points? So for example, in this case, could we steer it to this purple one and never let it get to the really high resistant point? Can we do that? And are there data to suggest this is feasible? So this is the question we asked. We did this through the same idea, this fitness landscape. It turned out in the 1930s, a gentleman named Sewell wrote down uh, a way to do this. So I'm just stealing math from the 30s, nothing new. Um, everyone would recognize this as a square. Right? <laughs> so it's a good thing. And think of this as like a Punnett square from like high school biology, school biology. You know, you have blue eyes and seven fingers. And then you have blue eyes here, seven fingers here, blue eyes and seven fingers. Neither blue eyes nor seven fingers, right? Everyone's comfortable with this object. You can expand this to three dimensions, and then four, and then five, and then n. So now if you have n alleles, you can represent as on or off. You now have an, a specific representation of this object. And now you can write down a function, a fitness function that maps from whatever that string is to some fitness. So fitness in this sense is just gonna be a number. It's gonna be maybe the concentration of drug that you can beat as, a, as an organism. MIC, for example, in the bugs. It can be anything you want. But in this case, we're gonna just formally represent this genotype phenotype mapping as this function. So you take a bit string that is your genome and you get a number out. Cool? 
So that means any space on here is, is a bit string. It's not perfect, but, and then you get a number out. So what you can then do is make some assumptions. And so in this paper, we specifically invoke something called, yes, sir, please. Uh, so if you have type of string, you have more than two different Yeah, you can have the two to the n genotypes. This one? Yeah, so you can have n alleles, any of which can be either 0 or 1. So you choose, let's say you choose 10. You can then have a bit string of length 10, and you can have any possible combination of those. So you're, you're basically, the, the alleles of one, n does not only reflect the number of positions in the genome, but positions times the alleles, right? Yeah, yeah, so, so you, the, the number of possible uh, iterations we two to then. In the case that you use 0 or 1, um, I've been recently reviewed to, you know, reviewers have suggested why don't you use four because there's a, you know, whatever the names of the base pairs are. I'm a physicist, I can't remember. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, or uracil, depending. Anyway, so you, you can put four there. The beauty of this formalism is you can just choose whatever you like. Uh, and then, again, this picture's not right because th this is representing two continuous dimensions. Our heads just don't do well with um, hills and valleys on big uh, binary spaces. Yeah. So then what you can do is invoke some assumptions. And in this paper, we, we use this very common assumption called strong selection weak mutation. And this allows you, you're some, in some regime of population size and mutation rate such that you can assume that when a, a mutation happens, it fixes. This is actually a pretty bad assumption for cancers. And we'll come to relaxing this in a bit. But in our first attempts, we are able to t sort of think about how evolution is going to move through some complex genotype space, just like those hills and valleys I showed, but in a more uh, complex way. So what you can do is if you had a data type, for example, let's say someone had uh, an E. coli and they did site-directed mutagenesis and they chose three sites that were important based on previous literature or intuition or whatever. And you can imagine creating a strain. You do, first, you flip the first bit. So you mutate the first gene of interest. Then you flip the second bit. Then you flip the third bit. That's one trajectory through this space. But you can measure the fitness at each of those positions. And now you get a more Re correct representation of the hills and valleys. So each of those points, so here is a peak, 0.73, everything's pointing toward it. That's an uphill, just like we had before. And maybe there's another peak over here. Here's another peak over here. Everything's pointing uphill toward this. And the branch points exist like here, for example. You can go uphill this way or that way. Sorry, where are you? There you go. So in, in this paper, we stole some data from people uh, with E. coli, so it was MIC in particular. We'll use growth rate later. And when I show you some cancer data, we'll use IC50. But in this case, so this is just a cartoon of how it could work. So you can use any proxy for fitness you like in this very theoretical mathematical object. So then you can write down transition probabilities. So you can say, what's the probability of going from point I to point J in this space? What's, it poss what's the probability of mutating in this some direction? And so we had to choose a specific formalism. So this is a, a well-studied one. You're just saying the fitness of where you're going minus the fitness of where you are. So how fast are you going to go uphill? And then you can tune this to be however you want. It could be randomly uphill. It could be always the fastest uphill. So if computer scientists in the room, this is gradient descent or at random walks. You can do this in a million different ways. This is a well-studied stuff. But at the end of the day, you can go from these data types that we were describing, someone doing clever biology. You could do this with CRISPR. You could do it in a number of different ways mapping this onto a mathematical object, and then you end up with something that you can write down so you can understand how things per move through these spaces. Then you can grab some data. So someone did, thankfully, this um, group in California did do site-directed mutagenesis for four different alleles within E. coli. And then beautifully, they mapped these hills and valleys for us. Well, they didn't do it for us, but they did it, and they published it, so we used it. Um, and they were able to do this under 15 different drugs. And so we were able to sort of take these ideas that we had and, and ask questions about the ordering of drugs, the sequencing of drugs. So if we give this drug and allow evolution to go where it's going to go, what are the evolutionary consequences in other drugs? So this is exactly like that picture I showed earlier, right? So if this is my first line drug, say, these are, my, these are all those other hills and valleys underneath that picture. So what can we say about that using this mathematical model? So the first thing we can say, which is really cool, we, we can write down lots of things that mathematicians like. We can write down steady state distributions. We can write down temporal dynamics. Surprise, at infinite time, things go to the peaks. But again, this is the infinite time that nobody wants to wait. So we'll, we'll get to that. We'll relax that in a bit. And so we, at the end of the day, we can work out evolutionary processes with something as simple as matrix multiplication, which is cool, because computers do it, mathematicians do it. 
Anyone can do it. Um, and we get these limiting behaviors. So the first cute result was that evolution doesn't commute. Why doesn't evolution commute? Because matrix multiplication doesn't commute <laughs> unless you have some very strange situations. So what does that mean, though? So here I am in clinic. And so this dirty little secret in clinic is that we all use UpToDate to figure out what to do next, which is an app on your phone. So your patient comes in. They have a MRSA infection, say. And then you're like, oh, what should I do now? Ah, I'll give vancomycin next. Yep, that's allowed. But I could also give dapsomycin next. Or I could give tigacycline or linazolid or any of these other drugs. Which one should I use next? Does it matter? Yeah, it does. Because the order in which you give things drastically affects the evolutionary process. So you take a polar bear and start breeding it in California for a while. It's going to be a very different creature that ends up at the end of that process than if you took a brown bear and started breeding it in the Arctic for a while. Although in a few years, the Arctic's going to be like California, so maybe it won't matter. I mean, that's a bad example. So here, beyond what drug and dose, the order in which we give them is going to drastically affect the outcomes. So when you're trying to look at patient populations. You're running a clinical trial, for example, and you only accept patients who have failed third-line therapy, but they've all had the different A, B, and C. You're not even comparing apples to apples anymore, according to our theory. So a problem. So uh, that's not important. So what we showed here is really that rational ordering, if you know what all those landscapes look like, and you're able to order them in a rational sequence, you can actually effectively move the population kind of how you want. Obviously, you're limited by the tools you have, the tools here being the drugs, but thinking about those drugs in a different way. You can move things through these spaces in a sensible way, in theory. So is there any, any data to suggest that this is meaningful in any way? So what kind of experiments could we think about? So let me first show you just like a couple of little simulations to get, get your head around what this might look like. So I, I showed you the transition probabilities. And if you're an algebraicist, you'd be like happy and you'd be done. But I'm not. I'm a physicist. So let me show you a couple of videos to show you like what this evolutionary process might look like. So here's our drug. This happens to be ampicillin. I'm going to show you what every single genotype looks like. We're going to start here at wild type. And then we're going to watch the population dynamics as they come and go through this space. And then we're going to look at allele frequencies and entropy, just as through time. And so what you're going to see the size of any given vertex represents how many are there. And you're going to watch this creature, whatever it is, move through this space as it goes. And so you're going to have this slow evolution as it starts to find these peaks. Again, how long do you have to wait for it to find the peak? I'm actually going to stop this simulation before it gets there. There's another peak that's going to arise afterward. So this is sort of how these processes are working. So trying to think about what these data types might look like if you sampled the same patient over time, what would it look like? What would it tell you? How could you infer some of these spaces? These are problems I don't have the answer to. I'm hoping that I can get someone to help me figure it out. Um, there's barcoding we can use in yeast. This is a paper from uh, a, new, a, a new investigator at Cambridge, Jamie Blundell. If you haven't met him, you should. He's cool. He figured out how to do this in yeast with Sasha Levy and Dmitry Petrov. Um, we can start doing some of So there are data like this over time in cancer patients, at least with entropy and Barrett's esophagus and other places. We could think about doing this. You were showing a couple of time points in your talk, um, thinking about how that change is occurring. Can we use the information about that change to understand this object? I don't know. I'd like to be able to figure it out. I've been thinking about that for five years and haven't gotten any closer. So um, maybe you can help. So what if we give two drugs at once? So this, at time two, we change drugs. What's going on here? This is the example where the peaks are the same. So all of a sudden, you reach a peak in the first drug. You get to the second drug, and nothing happens. Let's, let's put a different drug in between. So same first drug. Peaks are the same as this one. First drug and last drug are the same as the last simulation I showed you. But all of a sudden, by throwing some other drug in the middle, we're going to see different things. So at time two, we're going to change drugs. And at time three we're going to, or four, we're going to change back. So now we've actually given the first, same first and last drug, which before just gave us this steady state blue population all the way across. By just putting one more in the middle to kind of mix things up, we've actually found an entirely new steady state. So these dynamics are fast, at least in bugs, in cancers probably as well. They're somewhat repeatable. How repeatable, I'm not sure. But they're happening right in front of our face. And the question I would ask is, if, can we understand what these objects look like from these imperfect data? Well, certainly not unless we start taking these data. But can we? I don't know. So what are the consequences of this? right? So now we can move things around in this space. Or I hope I've convinced you that in my theoretical model, I can move things around in this space. What are the consequences of that? So remember those maps we showed earlier of the evolutionary consequences? If you're resistant to this, how sensitive you are to that, these collateral sensitivity maps. So previous studies have said, hey, you know, if you go, if you give this drug, even my study said if I give 
Seretinib first, then Pemetrexid's great next, and the gentleman in the corner was like, what if you did it again? In our simulations, actually more, so this, this is one example. If we run each experiment one time, we get a, an iteration of this map. It turns out if we, we actually ended up just doing the maths for just those easy 15 drugs, it turns out that there's more possible maps that you could get than there are atoms in the Milky Way for just those 15 drugs with four alleles. That's bad news for me, being the guy who wants to take advantage of this, right? So what we asked is, well, are there repeat, are there, are there, is anything repeatable? Are any of these events more than one over the number of atoms in the Milky Way feasible? The answer is probably yes. So we actually have a best case, a worst case, but our average and most likely scenarios actually show that at least in, some, at least in certain cases, there are reliable cases of at least having a better response than before. If you're not always going to get the same response, you're at least always going to be better. So there is this possibility that we could at least start thinking about likelihoods of being better off. Maybe we don't know exactly where you're going in this genotype space because it's really big. How big is the genome in a cancer cell? Order 10 to the ninth, which means in my case, it should be four to the 10 to the ninth possibilities. That's too many. Um, Obviously, some of those are disallowed because it's synthetically, synthetic lethality, and then like a lot of those cases aren't human; they're just like you know dolphin or something. But the point is, it's really big, and it, even in one tiny tumor sample, how much heterogeneity do you see? Massive, right? So the question is: is we're, we're coming to the point where we think we can at least say we'll be better off with A and then B rather than B and then A, but we're not ever, I don't think, going to be able to say what the sensitivity will be next. So can we do experiments to show that any of this is even remotely legit? So let's, let's, let's consider the following no longer Gedanken experiment, actual experiment. How do you say actual experiment in German? Experiment? OK. So let's do the following actual experiment, which Florian will say in German later. So let's take E. coli from the same stock, so you know, as close to the same bug as you can possibly get. And let's do the same experiment. Let's just be boring and do it 60 times. I'm going to show you 12 replicates because 60 is too much to look at. Let's just put them in a boring drug you can buy off the shelf. So this is going to be cefotaxime, which is like a first generation cephalosporin. We give it all the time. Let's just expose them over the course of 10 days in this beautiful, this is called a gradient plate. What you do is you spike the middle with the drug, and then you spin it right round, round, round like a record baby, round, round. And then physics takes the drug toward the outside. Right? And so in the middle, it'll be high concentration. At the edge, low, maybe zero. So what you do is you just seed four quadrants where there's no drug. You wait a day. The bugs figure out the drug. They move toward the middle. So this is your most resistant clone, most resistant clone, most resistant clone. You grab that clone, restreak it the next day. Do this experiment. It only takes 10 days. It's pretty cool because I have zero patients. And what do we find? We find that they all go uphill. They all get more fit. But they all do it with really different trajectories. So over the course of 10 passages, they're all reliably climbing some hill in their genotype space, but they're doing it at different rates. And they're doing it for different reasons. So these are, happen to be five or six different point mutations that we found that, confer, that are no, well known to confer fitness with just Sanger sequencing. But then what I'm asking is what are the consequences of where you went, right? So it looks like there's at least some repeated fitness levels, whether those are the same genotypes, I got no idea. But what are the consequences of that? Do they actually have any of these collateral sensitivity changes that I've been talking about? And it turns out they do. So they've, it turns out if you just do this experiment, you'll find evidence of strains that are, remember, exactly the same strain to begin with and just 10 days worth of evolution later in the same exact, same day, same lab, same petri dish, same drug, nothing else has changed. You find instances of massive sensitivity and heavy resistance r happening right next to each other. So I'm going to make an argument that this is evidence for these divergences that I've been playing with mathematically, evidence for a possibility of evolutionary consequences that are diverging. And so you can read about that in a paper earlier this year, which is in that reference list. But, but what about cancer? That's why we're here, right? Isn't that what the O is in contra? So let's take a similar experiment and do it in cancer and see what we can come up with. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an ALK-mutated non-small cell lung cancer. Why did I choose that one? Because I had it sitting around the lab. Um, I don't, I don't really care what cancer it is. The point here is it's an evolving population of individual things on which mutation is occurring, selection is happening. But I'm going to choose these because it's a nice family of drugs. And to be honest, it was the previous paper, so I already had everything sitting around. But let's then ask the question, what happens if we give these three different drugs and we look at, so this is now single cell RNA sequencing, at the evolved point. Everyone's familiar with what TSNE is. 
Is everyone familiar also that it's garbage? Because <laughs> you know you like TSNE. I hate TSNE. It's so good at showing you that things are different, but gives you zero intuition as to why they're different. As a matter of fact, like being here and being there, that, that doesn't mean anything. It just means you're not the same. It's a frustrating, like, necessary thing, because the reviewers are like, where's your TSNE plot? And I'm like, do you want any biological intuition about this system, or you just want a pretty picture? TSNE plot. Pretty picture then. TSNE plot. OK, fine. So TSNE. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing that if you give crizotinib or electinib or lorlatinib to a wild type population of cells, you have divergence in this space, whatever this dimension reduced space means. I'm not going to go into detail. We've done a bunch of other analyses, which I think are more telling. But the point is, is we have this divergence. And these are the same, they're supposed to be the same drug. They're hitting the same target with caveats we could go into and argue. But is that, is that what's really happening? Are we finding this, is this different peaks? They actually look much more similar than they did in the bacteria. But again, there's no intuition from space in these plots. But at least we're seeing some version of clustering between the, the different drugs. So the crizotinib's all over here, not over here. The electinib's all over here, not over here, and vice versa. How are they getting there, though? I showed you these beautiful time plots in the E. coli, right? They're kind of marching through some landscape. What, oh, sorry, is this evidence for divergence? What if we did the same experiment where we took electinib, in this case, and we did single cell, single cell RNA sequencing at different time points? So now, again, we're taking the same boring wild type cells, and at four hours in the drug, we're taking single cell RNA seq. At 48 hours in the drug, we're taking RNA seq. At four weeks, we're taking RNA seq. Three weeks, we're taking RNA seq. And then the final revolve resistance. Here we march reliably through this space. So is this climbing a hill? Is this a hill? Can, can, I, can I just map that straight back to a hill? Probably not. But you don't even know if you're marching to a hill at that stage. Yeah, you don't. Expression. Yes. You might just be stuck there and you, because the good people who do all the signal cell stuff can never differentiate between cell types and cell states or anything. So you don't yeah. know what's actually happening. You don't. That's exactly right. There's, there's a million problems. I got 99 problems and that's one. Um, and, but, I, but I do think that we're at least seeing some reliable state change occurring on, again, pretty short time scales. I mean, this is just four hours that we're getting this pretty big shift. And I guess another question to ask would be, you know, is the, is the mechanism by which the change from zero to four hours the same as the mechanism by which you change from zero to four weeks? Probably not, right? In the first four hours, you're probably just rewiring things. Whereas at, you know, three weeks, maybe you actually do have a couple of changes in there. As a matter of fact, in this specific population, we also did whole genome and there was no um, known driver events. So we are thinking that this population, the biology paper, which you can read here, again, in the reference list, goes more deep into this. But the, we're actually thinking that there's no meaningful genetic change in these four weeks. But again, I guess so here's another different way of clustering this in a more meaningful way. It actually looks like through time, each of these states are flipping sort of um, in almost a binary transition. I'm not going to go into this. But the, the idea being that here we started here, we're actually ending up going through this, again, the, the problems with TSNE are myriad and, and multifold. I'm not going to go into them today. But we ended up with uh, RNA velocity. Uh, we actually did try RNA velocity. We tried Velocido, uh, Pathfinder, Monocle, all of them. <laughs> so we could, that's a great question um, that I don't know the answer to yet. We, we have struggled to, with these data. So the cool thing, so RNA velocity, if folks aren't uh, familiar, there's a beautiful couple of papers that have come out recently um, from a few different groups with a few different packages you can use. The one we played with the most is called Velocito. Mostly it's been applied to developmental biology, where they show pretty, really pretty cool. What, what they do, it's clever, they look at um, pre and post transcribed stuff. And the idea being, you know, if you know how much is about to be transcribed and how much just was, you can figure out if, if a single gene is going, to be is, is going up in expression and going down. And what you can get, I actually have tons of plots that I was, so, I was so excited about this. When that paper came out, I was like, oh my god, we're going to do RNA velocity and like, actual velocity. Because most of those papers come from a single time point, and they make inferences about change. I'm like, I got, I got actual time here, baby. Like, we can go, this is before I realized that TSNE was Crap. So what I was, I, I was trying to do is like, I'm a physicist, right? So I was like, hey, I've got distance and I've got time, so I've got velocity. Here we go. Um, and so I ran Velocido, and then I tried to see if the, um, the phase plots that I pulled out were the same. No is the answer. Probably because TSNE is garbage. Um, or, or alternatively, because it's not what I'm looking at. But, but the short answer is I would love to do that, and I haven't um, 
figured it out yet. So th th this is real time. Each of these was measured at a different time. But again, uh, so four hours between these two. Yeah, that's, that's possible as well. Um, but there's a whole bunch of fun questions to ask with an experiment like this. Do any of the pseudo time calculators work? Do any of, you know, so we're working on that as well. But there's lots of fun things you can start doing that we're just scratching the surface of. But for the purpose of this talk, I just want to illustrate that we do have some step by step motion. I don't think what we, what, what, I think we could all agree, even, if, even with the limitations of this, that what we're not seeing is a single mutation that confers resistance and that sweeping. So uh, two peaks is not enough. My, my original cartoon is garbage because there's maybe two billion. But, but how many is enough? I'm not really sure. Um, I don't, that's a question I can't answer yet. And then so what, what have we talked about? So I've got the one. Oh, I'm actually kind of close. I'll move faster. So let's say we figured all that out. There's still the issue with this time. So it's, only, it's a central focus of talk, but it's only like five slides, so don't worry, I won't go over time. I was in the Navy for a long time. I freak out about punctuality. I will end exactly at 1230. Trust me. I might go faster and faster until I get there. I might reach a sort of singularity of speed. But that's OK. You'll have lunch. So we've been talking all along about how long it takes to get from one state to another, what state you're going to go from and to. What are the consequences of going to an individual state? Right? That's what we've been chatting about this whole time. And in the beginning, I was taking limits, and I was going to infinite time. And then I started doing experiments where I had a real time scale. So a medic will look at this and be like, hey, this is PKPD. right?" So all of a sudden, I give a patient a pill. The concentration goes up in their blood or IV. It goes up in their blood or up in their tumor. And it reaches some steady state that I keep them at for some arbitrary length of time. So let's say we do that. Now let's say, let's say I figured out everything else I told you in this talk. I figured out I nailed everything, which I, of course, won't. But let's say I nailed it all. And I know exactly what three drugs to give in a row to have this perfect response at the end. Let's say I've done that. First of all, Nobel Prize for me. Sweet, I'd already be retired. But let's say I've done it. How long do I have to wait? How long do I have to wait to get there? And can I make it faster? If it's infinite time, who cares? It's stupid. If the time scale's longer than the expected time of the disease, I don't care. So it doesn't have to be infinite. If it's a year, maybe that's too long. If it's a month, maybe that's too long. So can we do anything about this? So let's think about an even simpler fitness landscape with just two peaks. And now we're, we're going to think like physicists, so we're going to turn the peaks upside down, because physicists love a well. So let's take this really boring one, s equals 0, so selection coefficient. We're moving into population genetics land now, but we're not going to worry about that too much. We're going to keep the same graphical intuition about this space right in our hands. So with no selection, the two types that you have, the resistant and sensitive type in some new setting, are equivalently fit. So their population distribution is going to look like this. They're going to sit right in the middle, 50-50, hanging out, being happy. As you tilt the landscape, as you give a selection toward one type, 0.001 toward this type, you shift that population distribution to over here. As you go negative, the same thing happens the other direction. Does that make sense? Temporal dynamics of that are a little bit harder to nail. It's easy when you look at long time dynamics, but if you write down, in this case, a drift and diffusion equation, which is just a partial differential equation in a couple of variables, just really how quickly we move from one hill to another. Don't worry too much. For physicists in the room, this is just a Fokker Planck equation that we've derived from just diffusion and mutation. That's it. So there's two parameters to this model, and you can come up with an expected distribution. That expected distribution is going to be this one. So if you change from this s equals 0 to s equals 0.01, this PEQX and this distribution here is going, to be, is going to be this one, and vice versa. So we can run forward a numerical simulation of this. Uh-oh. Cool. We can run forward a numerical simulation of this, and it works out fine. We end up with some, you're going to see a plot in a moment, and then we're going to watch two videos, and then we'll be done. You're going to run forward a plot. You start with one of one type. You end up and you kind of fizzle around, and here's your distribution at steady state, right? So you can get there. These maths work. So how does this work through time? So let's, let's start with no drug, where the, where, the mute, where the wild type is favored, and let's give the patient a drug where now the, the mutant is favored. So we're going to go from exactly what I showed you before. We're going to give that drug, and we're going to wait. And what we're going to see down here is a little movie that shows right over here, we have some population distribution. We're going to end up over here. But how long does it take to actually get there? Well, the expected distribution goes exactly 
as the drug goes. But the real population takes time to get there. There's a lag as it equilibrates. Right? This makes sense. You saw those videos earlier on the, on the Tesseract that I showed you. These things don't go, they don't snap where they're going. They lag. So we've then stolen a really cool result from quantum computing where people have asked similar questions. If we have one quantum state, we want to get to another one. Can we drive it fast? Uh, this is in line for Nobel Prize. I'm not. People who figured this out is. This has actually been shown in a physical system just to work. Have you ever heard of an op optical tweezer? It's pretty cool technology. You shine a laser at a glass bead, total internal reflection happens. You can move the bead with light. What? Crazy. The problem is if you move too fast, the bead lags. So you like move your laser, bead's like Meow. People don't want that. No one wants our tweezer to be lagging. So you want to be able to drive it arbitrary speed. So this is in Nature Physics from last year or two years ago. And now we're going to show the same formalism here. So we can derive something called a counterdiabatic driving, where this looks complicated. So this S of t function is just this function of drug increase. And we, so, sorry, this S of t is this drug increase logistic. And then this counterdiabatic is just the standard drug increase plus a correction factor. That looks sort of horrible, but it's actually not bad. It's two parameters. That's it. So there's just your mutation rate and your drift. And so now we can do the same thing. We're going to look here at a video, and then we're done. And we're going to go from the first state to the final second state. But we're going to go now at arbitrary speed, which is going to be pretty cool. So if you look, there's a green dotted one underneath the red. See it? So that's the real driven population. It sticks right on that predicted one, whereas the undriven population takes for friggin' ever. OK, so this is our speed up that we're super excited about. If you encode this in a simulation-based model with actual individual cells, and over time, same thing happens. So you get, so this is now the, the driven distribution, the predicted distribution, and, and the sort of real one at your regular dose changing. So this is the person who's, who's they're going to get there. It's just going to take infinite time. Not good for my 18-year-old patient. So we're hoping that this will work out. Um, if you like things like kullback levo divergences, you can see that it's asymptotically approaching the steady state, blah, blah, blah. No one cares. Um, so did we answer any of the questions that I posed at the beginning? So where, where and when will, where will evolution drive the disease? What are the consequences? I hope I tried to answer some of those. How fast will it go? I think I have my hands on the knobs. And can we control these things? And that's sort of what I wanted to get across. There's my team. Does anyone know who that is? Who is it? I heard it. No, you're close. That's a transformer. This is Voltron. Voltron is this super awesome robot. Um, so each of these little lions are also super awesome robots that are driven by a little dude or dudette in its head. And then if their planet is under attack by like some sort of extraterrestrial baddie, the you know, green lion or whatever will get in their robot and go kill it. But if it's a super bad baddie and you need this guy, each lion turns into a body part. And then the robot forms in space. His sword appears out of nowhere. It, its sword, it's um, non-binary, it's a robot. Um, its sword appears out of nowhere, and it slays the baddie. And I feel like this is the perfect example for what we do here. right? So each of us has our own skills, represented by a lion color in our lab. Uh, each of us has our own skills, but when the problem is really hard, like evolution of drug resistance, we all have to come together and, and um, be Voltron. So anyways, thanks. If you missed it before, there's that. Oh, yeah. Great question. So the mathematical answer is, that's easy. Give me a function for how it changes mutation rate. I just plug in the new thing. The real answer is, whoa, I don't know. Um, so uh, does anyone know this guy called Michael Lynch at Arizona? He's an evolution guy. He's got uh, two strains of E. coli that he's evolved over like four or five years, so like a medium-term evolution experiment. One that has 100 times the mutation rate of the other. But they started as the same strain. Um, and he's actually done the same thing with like, just not knocking out mismatch repair. And uh, we're eager to start doing experiments on them to ask to answer this question. I, could, I, I, I can, right now, write down what our, our model predicts for those differences. Um, but I don't know if it'll play out. Good. Uh, I have a question. Can you include cooperativity in your models? So, for example, in the uh, bacterial case, uh, you have one strain which is uh, resistant to one drug, and you have another one which is resistant to the other. And if you mix them, the mixture is. <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. Each other, right? They can exchange 
Netherlands, for example, and this happens with cancer cells most probably as well. Yeah. I guess it dramatically changes. Uh, it dramatically changes these things. Um, there's a whole other talk that I could give tomorrow if someone drops out that answers exactly that question. If you remember that very first cartoon I showed on like slide one, there was that idea of using evolutionary games to think about that cooperativity. Um, and so that's, that's exactly the focus of a different part of our lab. We have a paper out in that reference list, if, you're, if you got that reference list, uh, Nature, Ecology, and Evolution earlier this year, where we designed an assay in particular to study exactly that. So we have a biological assay that can tell us exact, well, we think, it, it's designed to tell us exactly how those interactions happen. It's super simple. It's, again, the same cell lines I've been using for the whole talk. It's those ALK sensitive and ALK resistant ones. But we played out an evolutionary game in those to measure specifically the cooperation. And we found there was some. We've since done it in a different cell line, and there wasn't any. So I think it probably is quite context dependent. There's probably some types that interact and some don't. So yes? And my second question would be, um, could you give a, a biological correlate for your encounter and your perturbation of the system? Um, so I can tell you how I do it. Is that what you want? Yeah, oh. I mean, it, because you, in the introduction, you said you're a radiation oncologist. Oh, yeah, I can't do it with radiation. For an argument that basically you increase the mutation rate by radiation. Yeah. But I guess that's not your counter-diabetic. Yeah, the counter-diabetic driving is more like if you know the fitness effect of a drug, can you modulate the dose at which you give it through time, the function of its dose per time, such that you speed up the equilibration process? So in particular, the, the experimental um, iterate, the experimental realization of this that we're trying to do would simply be start with no drug, immediately give some low dose, wait for equilibration to happen, parameterize the model from that equilibration, and then give some different dosing profile through time and see if you can speed it up. If we can nail that, we're going to be in good shape. The theory works out and it's cool already, so some physics journal will be psyched, but biologists aren't going to care unless we can do it, right? So basically, the, the clinical correlate of your counter idea about is a metronomic protocol. Oh, uh, careful. That's, that's uh, dangerous water. Um, whole other part of my research is about that. We can talk about that offline. So I would say no, it's not metronomic. The counter-diabetic stuff would, would really just be the, um, it wouldn't be on-off, on-off. It would be just a different temporal profile. Uh, so cancer drugs are, of course, great. And the context, right? But, but, but to some extent, the only thing you using is that you're, you're, you're moving the cancer cells, and of course it's advantageous if there's a difference between how cancer cells respond and how other cells respond. Right? So the cancer drugs are good in that sense, but conceivably you could, so, you, know, you could use anything which has these properties, right? Absolutely. Differentiate between cancer cells and healthy cells and move cancer cells in one way or another. Absolutely. So have you any ideas about what to use here? That is a really good question. And I don't have any good ideas, but I just, I'll, I'll point you to a preprint a friend of mine wrote that's out right now, a guy called Kevin Wood at University of Michigan, where he actually used, he, he's studying similar things to me. He's in physics there um, in Enterobacter, which is a, a, a gut pathogen. Um, well, it's, it lives in your gut, whether it's pathogen or not, it's dependent. But he actually has done similar experiments to mine, where he's done these collateral sensitivity experiments, where he's used things like salt. He's used things like heat. He's used things, selective pressure. Everything is a selective pressure, right? Everything, every environmental context change is a selective pressure. And he's actually found that you can get collateral resistance and collateral sensitivity from stuff you can have in your cupboard at home to cancer drugs. Um, so yes, uh, it's in my mind, but I haven't had a chance to do the experiments yet. And, and in particular, something that sort of makes the tumor grow, then they have great opportunities for new jokes in the beginning of the talk. <laughs> yes. Good. Any more questions? So it's everybody very hungry. <laughs> in which case, just thank Jacob again. Thank you very much. Thanks.